Have you noticed the strange activity that is openly taking place all over the world? Recently, President Trump announced that the U.S. are to step up activity in space, or more specifically, space cadets, in a world's first military space force. Trump announced this during a meeting of the National Space Council, and you can't help but wonder what is going on. If you take the word of veterans from Korean, Vietnam, and Gulf Wars, then you are left with scores of witnesses that have come forward since the 1950s to speak about their activity in such a force. So there is little doubt this is already in place, yet it is only now being announced. The Space Division is going to surpass the budget of the Air Force, and it is described as being a critical element in U.S. military operations, and this will include the further development of spy satellites, weapon-controlled systems, Star Wars, and astonishingly, the inclusion of a new lightweight space bus for astronauts to more easily access space, much like the old space shuttle. This is a bold statement of intent from Mr. Trump, and he has proclaimed that America has the greatest heritage of being the world's greatest space-faring nation as new horizons will be explored and new frontiers will be tamed. Even more stunning is that this is viewed as America's destiny and vital for national security. If you are of the opinion that UFO activity has increased over the years, and the Pentagon even releasing such intelligence and the fact they are going to the moon and Mars, then you could suggest that bases on the moon and Mars possibly already exist. Why do we believe the UFO phenomena is alien and not human activity? Because humankind the world over cannot explain this phenomena and the craft we see are eons ahead of human technological advancements. Could the Space Force be a coordinated effort to either try to make contact or even intercept these craft. We surely are destined to interact with other intelligent life forms, so this seems like a plausible step, but as we said earlier, they only have announced this now, when in actual fact, they have attempted this for years. They need to tell us now because of the increased activity we are witnessing in our skies, and as the future unfolds, we will see much, much more sightings. Also, the UK announced that a successful project has just launched from the ISS armed with a huge net and a harpoon. They say this is to catch debris, but could there be a more sinister plot to these events and could they be linked with the European Space Agency developing a rocket to Mars? And the Japanese now beaming back images from their mission of the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft now arriving at the asteroid Ryugu with the strategy of observing the asteroid and ultimately deliver rocks and soil from Ryugu back to the Earth. And even the United Arab Emirates are getting involved with the announcement that they are to send their first astronauts to the ISS next year and wait to hear this. Alien civilizations could be harnessing the power of caged stars to stay alive in an expanding universe. Dan Hooper, a scientist at the U.S. Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, suggested extraterrestrials could store and collect stars through technology known as Dyson Spheres. Dyson Spheres are theoretical structures capable of confining a star to siphon its vast stores of energy. In a pre-publication research paper, Dr. Hooper theorized alien species use Dyson Spheres to stay ahead of expanding space. The presence of dark energy in our universe could be causing space to expand at an accelerating rate. In order to maximize its access to usable energy, a sufficiently advanced civilization would choose to expand rapidly outward, build Dyson spheres or similar structures around encountered stars, and use the energy that is harnessed to accelerate those stars away from the approaching horizon and towards the center of the civilization. According to the hypothetical scenario, technologically advanced alien species could target stars smaller than that in our solar system to utilize their incredible power. NASA has also just announced plans to protect our planet from a deadly asteroid strike. A global communications system to detect near-Earth objects and destroy them if they pose a threat to our world, 
With all the movement we are seeing in the Korean Peninsula and the great handshake between President Trump and Kim, then that too could be a sign of intent involving the world. We will have a collaboration with America and Canada, Europe and the UK. We will have India, Japan, Australia and even Russia and the UAE involved in a massive human movement towards understanding what exactly is going on above our heads and in space. There is also no doubt that there are things going on in space that is directly related somehow to the Earth. World governments are collaborating as we speak to try and understand just what this is. Is it life that is not aware we are even here? Or is it some sort of dimensional loop where stuff from a different realm altogether is getting lost in our part of space? Who knows what the answer is, guys, but whatever is going, they are now making it of public interest slowly but surely. And here's a thought. Could whatever data and intelligence gathered be so great, so massive, that they don't even care what they tell us about previous top secret incidents? Disclosure is coming. We are part of it. It happened in ancient times and is happening again. Whatever it is, gods, aliens, demons, angels, whatever these things are, they are certainly very real. What do you guys think of this anyway? Comments below and thank you for watching. Very importantly, I'm hereby directing the Department of Defense and Pentagon to immediately begin the process necessary to establish a Space Force as the sixth branch of the armed forces. That's a big statement. We are going to have the Air Force and we are going to have the Space Force, separate but equal. It is going to be something so important. General Dunford, if you would carry that assignment out, I would be very greatly honored also. Where's General Dunford? General? Got it? Let's go get it, General. But that's the importance that we give it. We're going to have the Space Force. One year ago, I revived the National Space Council and put exactly the right man in charge, and that's our friend, Mike Pence, who feels very strongly about this. And in December, I signed a historic directive that will return Americans to the moon for the first time since 1972, if you can believe that. Always remembering it's about that, but it's also about jobs and the economy. This is a great thing we're doing. This time, we will do more than plant our flag and leave our footprints. We will establish a long-term presence, expand our economy, and build the foundation for an eventual mission to Mars, which is actually going to happen very quickly. It's not enough that we're fighting with everybody that loves us. We're now going to fight in space. Ugh. Unless they're clearing up like the space junk that's like in the orbit, probably that, but nothing else, like aliens-wise. First, you got you got to find, uh, uh, you know, life in outer space. Trump says this won't just be any intergalactic fighting force. It'll be number one. When it comes to defending America, it is not enough to merely have an American presence in space. We must have American dominance in space. So important. The president defending his administration's zero tolerance immigration policy, overshadowing another announcement that any under any other circumstances would have made major news. The president wants to create a sixth branch of the U.S. armed forces, a so-called space force. Fred, if you would carry that assignment out, I would be very greatly honored also. Where's General Dunford? General? Got it? Hmm. What well, appears he still has a ways to go to sell the idea, even to some within his own administration. But it's turning out to be an important project for him. So we want to know more about why. Joining us now, Republican Congressman Doug Lamborn from Colorado, who sits on the House Armed Services Committee. He's from the Colorado Springs area where so much space and missile defense work is done. Congressman, thanks for joining us. I'm glad to do so. 
Okay, so listen, there are folks out there talking about a potential space war looming. They say we're way behind when it comes to China and Russia. It's not a topic we hear a lot about. What do we need to know? We, we need to know that if our uh, space assets are ever threatened in a time of conflict, our war fighters on the ground would be deaf, dumb, and blind. And we can't let that happen. We have to protect our space assets. We have to show the other side that we, we can put their assets at risk. But this all requires making military or defense space more of a priority even than it is right now. And that's what the president is after. And I think that that's very exciting and very timely and very necessary. Okay, so my understanding is that the Air Force handles about 80% of this right now. Uh, they, you know, by some reports, were not really excited about this. And here's what the Secretary of Defense had to say. Uh, this is a few months back. He said, I oppose the creation of a new military service and additional organizational layers at a time when we are focused on reducing overhead and integrating joint warfighting functions. What do you make of that? Well, I think the president is going to trump, uh, for, for, uh, pardon the phrase, but uh, over the defense uh, secretary. Uh, what the commander in chief desires and wants is going to be what we do. So I think uh, that's what's going to ultimately happen. The House and the Senate are in slightly different positions. The House is a little more reform minded. I think the Senate is a little more status quo minded. But we have to do whatever the final version is, we have to make space more of a priority. And the Air Force is taking some good steps. They're doing some good things. They're doing a study right now, for instance. But we have to make sure that uh, space is a more of a priority. It won't create more bureaucracy necessarily. The key is to make it better funded, a better priority, that the personnel within space have more clout and prestige, and that the acquisition, this is all important, that the acquisition process is faster and more effective. Right now it takes five to ten years to put a satellite up into space and that takes way that's way too long. Hmm. Technology changes so fast. Okay well I know the Pentagon has been working on a number of studies to wrap up. One major one, uh, independent review that was ordered by Congress, uh, is not even supposed to be until December. So some folks wonder if the president is jumping the gun on this. Now uh, Senator Bill Nelson, a Democrat who happens to be a former astronaut himself, says the president told us a general, told a U.S. general to create a new space force as sixth branch of military today, which generals tell me they don't want. Thankfully, the president can't do it without Congress because now is not the time to rip the Air Force apart. Too many important missions at stake. Will Congress block this effort by the president? Well, Congress plays a vital role in defining the parameters and defining how the process is going to be done and even some of what the final version will look like. But the commander in chief has the biggest voice of all. And I disagree with Senator Nelson. Uh, we do have to reform space, it's not the priority right now that it needs to be. It's tugged in too many different directions. Mm -hmm. The funding for it sometimes gets siphoned mm. off into other things because it's not the priority that it should be. And we all agree on the objective, even if we disagree on how to get there. All right, uh, Congressman Liam Warren, thank you for giving us some insights to something I really hadn't heard a whole lot about. We will follow it. Thank you, sir. The administrator has already been called out <laughs> and recognized warmly by this crowd, but let me add my congratulations uh, to Jim Bridenstine as the new administrator of NASA. We Thank are you, grateful sir. to have you on the team and on this council. I want to welcome you to your first meeting of the National Space Council, um, and uh, grateful to have you sitting in the chair and at, at uh, uh, representing NASA in this conversation. Uh, last December, uh, the President signed uh, Space Policy Directive 1, which directs NASA to return American astronauts to the moon. We have discussed that at some length, uh, privately, uh, and with your team, uh, to the moon first, and as the President said today, eventually to Mars. I know you've been diligently working with your team to develop a strategy to, to implement that Space Policy Directive, and I wanted to invite you to give the Council an update uh, on your work, but welcome. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, first of all, sir, it's an honor to serve my country in this capacity, uh, honor of a lifetime, and I'd like to thank you and the President for this opportunity. Um, I would also like to thank your Executive Secretary here on the Space Council, Scott Pace, um, who, when all the lights are off, I hear some... <laughs> when all the lights are off and the cameras aren't rolling, he works overtime to make sure this group is... Uh, is focused on a whole, of gov uh, a whole of government approach 
uh, under your direction. So thank you for that, sir, and thank you to the Executive Secretary, Scott Pace. I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention Jared Stout, who works side by side with Scott Pace on these issues. So we are underway executing the President's Space Policy Directive 1, which is our effort to return to the moon. And interestingly, we heard the President give his speech. He talked about it being sustainable. I wrote a few notes down of some things he said. He said that we've had a number of opportunities to go back to the moon since 1972. Um, he didn't mention them specifically, but the Space Exploration Initiative, the vision for space exploration, um, and each of these efforts got, in essence, undermined the words he used were by bureaucracy and politics. And so our objective now, following the direction of the president, is to get back to the surface of the moon and back to orbit around the moon in a sustainable way. Uh, and, and he said, if I remember right, he said, we want more than just flags and footprints this time. He also said, rich guys love rockets. And I've heard him say that before. That's an important thing to recognize because the architecture that we're building now is entirely different than any architecture we've ever built before in an effort to get to the moon. And the reason is we have more capabilities now than we've ever had as a nation, largely because of the efforts of many people in this room. The idea that we have reusable rockets to bring down the cost of launch and give us more access at a lesser cost than ever before, the miniaturization of electronics, these capabilities enable us to do more, in fact, with less, although thanks to you and the President, we're doing more with more, which is a, a good thing for the NASA budget, and we're grateful for that. So the, the opportunities before us are immense, and initially when we go back to, to the moon, um, there's a number of things that we need to do. We need low Earth orbit to be driven by commercial enterprise, and that's underway right now. Uh, under the President's budget request, uh, the, the International Space Station uh, will we'll no longer receive direct support uh, in the year 2025. Um, in some ways, that's a big challenge for us at NASA, and we understand the challenge before us. But for the first time, we're having very serious conversations about how to make low Earth orbit commercialized. We, want, we, we don't want any gaps in human activity in low Earth orbit, and that means commercialization is the key. Then we can take our resources at NASA and go further. In other words, to the surface of the moon and then on to Mars. The first program that we have getting to, to the moon is called uh, CLIPS, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services. What we call it in, at NASA, what we talk about is taking shots on goal. Commercial lunar payload services. These are not expensive missions and they're not carrying heavy payloads, but we're gonna give commercial companies an opportunity to land on the surface of the moon, uh, and we would be a customer of that. They would have other customers as well, but we would be one of many customers in a very competitive market with as many as six or even more providers for our access to the surface of the moon. The reason this is important is because all of these capabilities in a competitive environment uh, result in, in, in effect, um, not just competition on price, but competition on innovation. So we can do more than we've probably ever done before. It's also important to note, Mr. Vice President, that when we go this direction, we are taking shots on goal. Not every shot gets made. <laughs> so it is very possible that some of our commercial providers, who we believe there are a number of them that are ready, but maybe some of them are not. So there is a, there is a risk that some of them won't be successful. But what we learn through this commercial lunar payload services program will be critical for the next step, which is heavier landers, not just capable of delivering instruments, but capable of delivering prospectors, things that can dig. We know from NASA's achievements back in 2008 and 2009, we know that there are potentially hundreds of billions of tons of water ice on the moon. Uh, from 1972 until then, in 2009, we didn't know that there was water ice on the surface. We now know that. So that represents an opportunity for us to learn more about the moon than we've ever learned before um, because we're going to go to the surface and we're going to prospect. That means we need heavier landers that can, that can carry things that, that can prospect the surface of the moon. And then beyond that, we need heavier landers that can take humans to the surface of the moon. So this is an iterative process where we're building capability uh, that we really haven't had, sir, since 1972. While we're doing this, we're also going to put 
in orbit around the moon, uh, what we call gateway. This is our opportunity to have more access to more parts of the moon than ever before. When you land on the surface of the moon, you're in one spot on the surface of the moon. But what we want is we want access to the entire moon. We also want to make sure that everything we develop is reusable. This ultimately gives us more access to our international partners. It puts us in a leadership position where the standards and interfaces are established by the United States of America. And then the landers that go from the gateway to the moon, the tugs that go from low Earth orbit to the gateway, it's all reusable. And it becomes a critical piece of infrastructure that we can then capitalize on with our commercial partners and our international partners. Again, the goal here, following the President's Space Policy Directive 1, the goal is sustainability. We do not want this to be Lucy and the football again. When we go to the moon, we're going, and as the President said in his speech, this time we're going to stay. Uh, and the, the gateway gives us that great opportunity. It's also important to note that as NASA develops these capabilities, each one of these capabilities feeds forward. The reason we go to the moon is because we want to land Americans on the surface of Mars. And the technologies, the capabilities, the in situ resource utilization that we develop for the moon will ultimately get us to Mars. It's also why the gateway is so important. Having uh, an, an orbital outpost around the moon gives us more access to more parts of the solar system than ever before. And all those technologies are being developed uh, in and around the moon for the purpose of eventually getting humans to Mars. So, sir, I would say that Space Policy Directive 1 is well underway. We've got a long ways to go, but we're started, and certainly we want to get back to the moon as quickly as possible. Thank you. The United Arab Emirates is working to send a probe to orbit Mars. The UAE agency has called its mission Al Amal Hope and has now introduced it to the public. Various events have been organized in Dubai to give residents an insight into future plans for space exploration, workshops and interactive exhibitions that target families and schools. These activities are designed to encourage students to explore and research. The probe is planned to enter Mars's orbit in 2021, the 50th anniversary of the country's independence. It will be the first space exploration mission by an Arab state. The teams are working with scientists and academics at the University of Colorado. The idea is for the team to learn from their academic partners and bring the knowledge back to the UAE for the spacecraft assembly. Mars was once thought to be a habitable planet because of the presence of water just like on Earth. And recent explorations by NASA states that the red planet used to have a cool climate. This mission will be taking us to another level, so it will be adding to the level of science or knowledge about Mars and its atmosphere uh, to the scientific community. And that's very important for this mission that it gives back. Obviously, uh, ESA has a lot of uh, experience in Mars missions. They have a lot of Mars scientists, and we want to make sure that our data reaches them and that we can cooperate uh, with them on that data. Once the probe is in orbit around Mars, it will study all aspects of the planet's atmosphere the daily and yearly dynamic climates of the different layers and the elements that make up their proportions, and finally the release of hydrogen and oxygen into space. Scientists believe that Mars became too hot, which caused the water to evaporate and the molecules to escape through the edge of the atmosphere into space. Understanding what happened to Mars may help us to understand what is happening to our home, Earth, and how we can protect the atmosphere. Something else that's remarkable and, and, and some, somewhat similar to what we have here on Earth are the dust storms um, that occur on that planet. Now the dust storms, they're not like the dust storms we have here on Earth. Um, our dust storms sometimes last less than a day. But there, sometimes it can pick up, it lasts an entire day, it covers the entire planet, and it starts at one region and then engulfs the entire planet in a global dust storm that sometimes might run for days or weeks. At present, there are 75 people in the Emirates Mars mission team. The sum of 5.44 billion US dollars has already been invested, and the question is not whether these funds will be sufficient, but whether the timeframe set by the UAE will realistically allow the completion of the project.
This region needs uh, positive news such as this mission to get the youth excited that, you know what, uh, Arabs and Muslims can work on uh, innovative projects, exciting projects, and they can contribute to the global picture of science and technology. This mission is a gift from the UAE to the world. Those in charge of the space program hope the first Arab mission to Mars will be a source of inspiration to millions of young Arabs in the way Americans growing up in the era of the Apollo program crave the prospect of space exploration. The United Arab Emirates Space Agency is very young. The average age of its engineers is under 40. Sending a probe to orbit Mars will allow the UAE to join the list of the few countries aiming to reach the Red Planet. Rita del Prete, Aeronews, Dubai.